Good morning. I'm Susan Pertnoy here with Barbara Kay. Welcome to Mosaic, Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine show. Now in our 40th season, Mosaic explores Jewish issues here in the Palm Beaches and around the world. With an alarming rise in anti-Semitism around the world, many people have turned to learning about the Holocaust for lessons on the consequences of bigotry. But just how good of a job are we doing at keeping the memory of the Holocaust in our minds, particularly for younger generations. We'll talk to the award-winning author of the preeminent book on why the Holocaust happened and why it still matters. And then we'll be joined by a local leader who's making sure that the memory and lessons of the Holocaust stay top of mind in the Palm Beaches. We'll be right back with Mosaic after this brief commercial break. If it wasn't for the financial assistance, I couldn't come here. Every little bit helps. She says, I get stronger every day. When you have a child and you want the absolute best for them, it's twice as important to make the community strong. Take part in an innovative, thought-provoking book and author series. Jewish Federation's Conversations with Jewish Women Writers offers a unique opportunity to experience an intimate discussion with authors of new books. Learn more and register at jewishpalmbeach.org slash conversations. Jody Cantor's Pulitzer Prize-winning journalism broke the story of Harvey Weinstein and sparked the Me Too movement. Join dedicated women to hear Jody's incredible and brave story at Jewish Federation's Lion of Judah Luncheon. This is Jewish Federation's flagship event for philanthropic women in our community. The luncheon is on Monday, February 4th at 11 a.m. at the Kravis Center for the Performing Arts. Learn more and RSVP today at jewishpalmbeach.org slash lion luncheon. Live the way you want to live in the luxury you deserve at Morse Life's Tradition. Choose a floor plan that suits your lifestyle and make it your own. Impeccable service and the gold standard in specialized signature health care. Live healthy live happy and tradition is where the living is easy every day and in every way your home morse life tradition we're on location at the beautiful jcc with dr peter hayes welcome to mosaic thank you very much you're a leading expert on the holocaust have written numerous books on the subject so tell me how is a boy from framingham massachusetts devote a Catholic boy, I should say, yeah, yeah. devote his life to the Holocaust. Well, I, w I was born in 1946, so I came of age in the, in the process of the American Civil Rights Movement. And that was the experience of my young life that made me uh, alert to the wider world. I also lived in a town where, as it happened, the part of town I lived in where most of my buddies were Jews. So I went to more uh, bar mitzvahs than confirmations. I had never had this sense that I was dealing with somebody different. These were just my friends. And then I discovered that there were people who thought that they were mortal threats and lesser beings, and that was puzzling to me. Um, and, you, and you add to that in the context of the civil rights movement, where I saw the injustice that American society could inflict. These things seemed related. And then the third part of the story is uh, the, the surprise. My sister married a guy who was born in Nazi Germany, and he was born in 1941. And he had come to America and grown up largely as an American kid. But um, I knew the part of the family that was left in Germany, and I was sent to live with them, and I learned the language from them. So this subject, kind of all the roads came together for me, as this is something that I thought was very important in a personal way, and I was curious about knowing more about it. Uh, so that's how it happened. And then the, the key ingredient that the Germans supplied, of course, was the language. Right. Hmm. 
You've recently written a book, a very prominent book on the Holocaust call, called The Why. Why did you write it and what do, how does it differ from all the other books on the Holocaust? I wrote it because I could. That is, I had taught at Northwestern for a long time. I taught the course on the history of the Holocaust 25 times. And I had arrived at a system that fit our academic calendar, which meant that I had to teach this subject in eight and a half weeks. I had to figure out a way to package the subject that it would fit in that framework. And the way I did it after a few years of trial and error was to devote each week to answering a question that students seemed to want to have an answer to. So when I got to the end of having done this 25 times and I was about to retire, I realized no other book had approached the Holocaust like this. There are many good books on the Holocaust that start at the beginning and take the story through to the end and tell you interesting and illuminating things along the way. But I didn't want to do it that way and I hadn't developed a course that way. I had a course that basically said, first we're going to say, how come the Jews are the target? How come the Germans are the principal killers? Why do they decide that they're going to murder these people? How do they get away with doing it as fast as they did? Why don't these people get more help? And that's the way I structured it. So I, I did it because I could. I had arrived at this system of presenting material to students, and it worked with students in the classroom. And I thought this might work with a larger audience. It, it, it's been very successful. So I have a sim I know this is a very simple question, but so significant. Why did the Holocaust happen, and specifically, to whom, and when did it actually start? The Holocaust happened because a group of people became convinced that the answer to all of their national, emotional, psychological, personal problems was the removal of a particular category of human being from the world. Um, this is a phantasmagorical belief. It beggars uh, Comprehension. We all, many people always say that the uh, Holocaust is, is uh, fundamentally incomprehensible because the motives are so bizarre. Um, but believing Nazis came to the conclusion that they could improve their nation's status in the world, they could improve the existences of individual Germans if they got rid of these people who they thought were doing bad things to them. Now, why do they fix on these people? Because there's a long tradition in Western culture of fixing on these people, which has prov provided more than enough rationales for attacking them. Uh, and at a particular moment in national crisis, people who believed in this kind of crack pottery actually were able to get power. Now, when does it start? From the point of view of the lives of individual Jews, it starts in Germany almost the moment the Nazis come in because there are individual acts of brutality and cruelty that begin um, right away in February 1933. But the actual decision to wipe these people from the face of the earth by means of shooting and bludgeoning and gassing and so forth takes about eight years to develop and develops out of um, first the Nazis discover what they can get away with. They can get away with persecuting German Jews and no other country is going to intervene. It's amazing. And a lot of German non-Jews are not going to intervene. Then they discover what they can't get away with. They can't actually drive all these people out of the country. And so finally they resort to something else that they realize, under cover of war, they can actually kill them all. And they proceed to do it. How did, how did the Nazis become so successful at creating a murderous society? How did they get away with that? Well, they had control of almost all means of communication within the society. And they had control above all of the reward mechanisms in society. People adapt very rapidly to what will bring advantage to them. And they become averse to what will not bring advantage to them. Once it became clear in German society that the Nazis controlled whether, who would get ahead and how they would get ahead, it became easy for people to first pay lip service to Nazi goals, then to actually internalize them, then to actually decide, okay, I will act in a way that uh, fulfills these goals because that also fulfills my personal advancement and so, and so on. So they create a society in which the hierarchy is imbued with racism and, and anti-Semitism. On that note, we have to take a break. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, more with Peter Hayes, author of the preeminent book on why the Holocaust happened and why it still matters.
take part in an innovative, thought-provoking book and author series, Jewish Federation's Conversations with Jewish Women Writers offers a unique opportunity to experience an intimate discussion with authors of new books. Learn more and register at jewishpalmbeach.org slash conversations. The tower at Morse Life has standards so high, we had to invent them. Call home a luxury rental community with a full continuum of unmatched high quality care at your doorstep and a rich, fulfilling lifestyle catered for you. Enjoy every day with a full menu of activities and five-star services. Elevate your thinking about how you deserve to live now and all the beautiful extras that are yours at the Levin Tower at Morse Life. It just feels like home. Secure your lease today. Jody Cantor's Pulitzer Prize winning journalism broke the story of Harvey Weinstein and sparked the Me Too movement. Join dedicated women to hear Jody's incredible and brave story at Jewish Federation's Lion of Judah Luncheon. This is Jewish Federation's flagship event for philanthropic women in our community. The luncheon is on Monday, February 4th at 11 a.m. at the Kravis Center for the Performing Arts. Learn more and RSVP today at jewishpalmbeach.org slash lion luncheon. If it wasn't for the financial assistance, I couldn't come here. Every little bit helps. She says, I get stronger every day. When you have a child and you want the absolute best for them, it's twice as important to make the community stronger. We're back with Dr. Peter Hayes and we're talking about Nazi Germany and the murderous society of the Nazis. Where was humanity in all this? Largely absent. Um, you have to remember that there are different categories of involvement on the part of Germans. The people who, the tens of thousands of people who participated in the persecution during the 1930s. Think even of bank tellers who became the people who control whether Jews can take the money out of their savings accounts because the government restricted how much they were allowed to take every month. That's a case where ordinary civilians are in fact enforcing racial discrimination, ethnic discrimination. But the actual number of perpetrators is not that great when you consider that Particularly, consider the example of the death camps. Um, the largest, the, the four camps that killed by carbon monoxide had all told fewer than 500 Germans who ever worked at them. And this oh is more than two million victims. The largest garrison was at Auschwitz, um, all told over the whole time of the, the Holocaust, a, a little over 7,000 people were assigned as guards and uh, who controlled Auschwitz. Many of them were not German citizens. They were Germans who lived in scattered parts of Eastern Europe who were brought there for the purpose. Now this is a, not a very large body. This is, that's a third of the number that the German army executed for desertion in World War II. So the Germans did this with relatively little allocation of personnel or expenditure or material. You can kill an awful lot of people with a small number of perpetrators. Um, even when you think of the Einsatzgruppen, the shooting units that went into Eastern Europe, there were four of these killing units that followed the advancing German army. They consisted of no more than 3,000 men altogether. Now allow for a little turnover over time and so forth. Maybe 5,000 people were doing the shooting on the Eastern Front in these units. So the Germans uh, are able to find these people because as a percentage of the German population, even if you think they're all pathological, it's not a very large percentage. And then you realize that most of them are not pathological, they're very simple. Um, only 30% of the guards at Auschwitz ever got beyond elementary school. We know this because we have the personnel records of the guards and they're preserved at the Auschwitz State Museum. So these are largely people who are very simple, who they, they these Germans who scattered over Eastern Europe live in very remote areas. They're brought together, they're given a uniform, they're told what to do, and they serve their masters. Um, so that's, that's how the, the process is created. Now at the top, 
these people are really Im ideological imbued haters. These are people who have, when they were fraternity members at German universities in the 1920s, steeped themselves in this sense of we've been robbed, we've been had, we are entitled to seek revenge of the, uh, against the other peoples who have humiliated us. So the true believers at the top are r very small, and they really are ideologically committed. And the people at the bottom are people who are taking orders. But the world looked the other way. What about that? The world looked at its own interests and said, uh, this is less important to us than the things that we care about. So, and interfering in the Holocaust was very difficult to do once the war started because most of the killing was done in areas that were remote from Allied forces. Even the westernmost death camp, that is, you have to have a map of Europe in your head to think where were the Allies. The Allies were, for most of the war, in Great Britain, mm -hmm. so to the west of the European continent. The westernmost killing center was Auschwitz. Even at the end of the war, in 1945, you could not fly a bomber from Great Britain to Auschwitz and get it back on a single tank of gas. So part of the indifference of the Allies was a sort of sense of impotence. We, we can't interfere with this process. Much of it happened while the Germans were winning the war. If you, if you take the turning point in the war as the Battle of Stalingrad, that's where the German army surrenders at the beginning of February 1943 in Stalingrad. At that moment, three quarters of the victims of the Holocaust already were dead. Oh, that's, that's really quite something. You've written another book called Industry and Ideology which speaks about the chemical plants in the Nazi Germany era. And why was it so important to write about that? Well, the, that book began as my doctoral dissertation. And so the first answer about every doctoral dissertation is um, it's so important because you know that there are documents you can use to write about it. And um, the 23 members of the board of directors of IG Farben were put on trial by the United States after World War II. They were put on trial because the company had been one of the principal producers of war material for the German army. It also co-owned the company that produced Zyklon gas that used at Auschwitz and Majdanek. It also um, had been uh, extremely important in, in the exploitation of slave labor. So there were all these moral issues about Nazi Germany and about civilian perpetration, civilian participation in persecution and killing that I wanted to answer. So IG Farben seemed to me a perfect lens through which to examine these questions. Because after all, the people who made the decisions in IG Farben to participate in this are respectable, suit-wearing businessmen. They are not SS men in black uniforms. These are people you think of as normally upstanding members of the community. And yet they made the decision to, to be part of this process. So that's what I wanted to understand. Thank you very much. We'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, a local leader joins our conversation with author Peter Hayes on how we're keeping the memory of the Holocaust alive in our community. If it wasn't for the financial assistance, I couldn't come here. Every little bit helps. She says, I get stronger every day. When you have a child and you want the absolute best for them, it's twice as important to make the community strong. Our lives are made of memories, but when those memories start to fade, your happiness shouldn't follow. At Morse Life's Memory Care Residences, your loved one is safe and secure with the very best care from our staff who are specially trained to work with memory loss. The greatest luxury of all is the peace of mind that awaits at the gold standard memory care residences at Morse Life. Find the life you love again. Secure your lease today. The Memory Care Residences at Morse Life. Take part in an innovative, thought-provoking book and author series. Jewish Federation's Conversations with Jewish Women Writers offers a unique opportunity to experience an intimate discussion with authors of new books. Learn more and register at jewishpalmbeach.org slash conversations. We're joined by Paul Gross, 
part of the Gross Family Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Antisemitism. Paul, tell us about your Gross Family uh, Free Speaker Series. Actually, Dr. Hayes was just at one of them. Well, it started here in Palm Beach County three years ago with the less than 100 people at the first lecture or two. We run about 12 per year uh, free lectures. We run them here at the JCC, bo uh, both in uh, Hood Road here and in Boynton Beach. Uh, they've been very, very successful, and they grew in the second year to two, 200, 250 people. And today's session was approximately 600 people. We haven't had less than 350 this year at any one of our lectures. So they've been extremely informative. They're very, very helpful. The good news is that we're turning out tremendous audiences. The bad news is we're not getting the students, uh, high school or college level, to attend. And we are trying. So just this past week, I met for the second or third time with the Deputy Superintendent of Schools of Palm Beach County, Keith Oswald. Uh, we've already met, my daughter Lauren and I, with Dr. Fanoy, who is the Superintendent of Schools. The school system in Palm Beach County is the 10th largest in the United States. There were 197,000 children in the Palm Beach County school system. Uh, there's only one superintendent, one deputy. It's very centralized control compared to most other school districts. And the Holocaust, as you may or may not know, must be taught in the state of Florida by, by statute. Well, <clears throat> the statute's there, but it's not being very taught very well uh, very, to very many students. So it's a very, very difficult problem to run it through 28 regional schools within the county. Is there even a standardized method of teaching throughout the state? No, not at all. It's the, the Holocaust is one sentence, the statute is one sentence to please teach about, not to please, to teach about the Holocaust uh, and the Nazi atrocities that occurred and the why and wherefores and so on. So your book, Why, which was a terrific lecture this morning that we had, we have offered 1,400 copies that the Gross family were going to pay for to give to every student in this entire school system in Palm Beach County, and they turned me down um, on the argument that they only change books every five years, and they're committed to this other book for the, another two and a half years, so it is what it is. But my goal, and Lauren's goal, my daughter, who's again running the program, is to get to the high school level because it's, work, it's wonderful to work with the senior seniors, but the difficulty is we need the junior juniors, we need the kids to learn about it and thoroughly understand it. Absolutely, not only in Palm Beach County, but globally we really need to, in, to insist on everybody learning about the Holocaust. So why is it so timely now that we make a push for speaker series and education about the Holocaust? Do you want to answer that? I think it's always been timely. I think that there are, uh, mo there are aspects of American life right now that suggest to people that the relevance of this topic has become greater. But I think the issue of combating anti-Semitism is eternal. And uh, it's as vivid to me now I, I, as it was when I first got interested in this subject, which is 50 years ago. Well, what about the fact that the Holocaust survivors in, in particular are, are dying out, and I think the youngest survivors are now in their 70s. Yes. Yes. That, that's, a, that's a problem. I well, think. They, are, they were children at the time, so they're not really experiencing the atrocities per se, but the county uh, school system and Dr. Fenoy and his deputy, uh, Keith Alfwell, have agreed with us that they will put, per our request, a survivor in every school next year, the 28 school districts, to teach to an assembly not to teach, but to describe their experiences. Because we've read over and over again that one lecture or discussion with a Holocaust survivor is more important than him reading 10 or 15 books about the Holocaust, that personal experience. So we hope to be able to bring that to every school system, to every child in the county next year. But it's certainly true that the problem is not going away. Obviously, the problem is going to get more uh, extreme with the absence of survivors altogether. It's not an unfamiliar problem to historians. It happens all with every subject over time. I'm old enough to remember in elementary school World War I veterans talking to me and the connection of personal, the personal connection that that makes. And they've obviously been gone now for a while. Um, 
that's the job of teachers. It's the job of all of us who are engaged with the subject to make it interesting, to make it absorbing, to give people a sense of personal connection through us with the subject. What about the resurgence of the issue of Holocaust denial? How do, how do we deal with that? Oh, I think we deal with Holocaust denial with contempt. Uh, that's really the first approach. The, the, the Holocaust is one of the best documented events in human history. We even have, people often forget this, there is a famous moment uh, where Heinrich Himmler gave a speech in October 1943 to the assembled SS commanders in a little town which is uh, now Poznan in, in Poland. Um, and Heinrich Himmler talked openly about the killing. We have a vinyl recording of that speech in the United States National Archives. There it, you can hear Heinrich Himmler's voice saying these things. We have enormous documentation of what happened. We have the registration books at Auschwitz. We have many of the manifests listing people as they were deported from uh, places in Western Europe where they were sent off because uh, what they did is as part of the concealment, they drew up from the people who were being put on the trains, they drew up lists by name of everybody who was on it. And the idea was, see, you see, we're keeping track of you and we're sending you to a place where they will want to receive these lists and so on. So we have enormous documentation about this subject. Deniers are simply ridiculous people who are trying to make this, uh, who are denying because it serves some function for them internally to say this couldn't have happened to these people or to this category of people. It's a form of anti-Semitism, denial. It is, it is. Well, I appreciate both of you joining us. It's so clear that education is the key to combating all of these ills and anti-Semitism and the Holocaust deniers. So I appreciate all the efforts that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org slash mosaic.